This is Tina Douglas, and you're listening to the Liam Photography Podcast with your host, my husband, Liam Douglas. Enjoy! Greetings, everybody. You're listening to the Liam Photography Podcast. I'm your host, Liam Douglas, and this is episode 229. So for this week's episode, a special treat for my listeners, especially the photography students out there, I've been trying to get somebody to come on the show and talk about the Fujifilm X series of cameras. Now, as you know, I did recently switch to the X series myself from Canon RF, but I didn't, I don't consider myself an expert on the X series system because I just started using it. Photography, yes, I've been doing that for 30 years, but I wanted somebody who's an actual expert on the Fujifilm system. So my guest for this episode is the one and only Dan Bailey. Dan is a professional outdoor adventure and travel photographer located in Anchorage, Alaska. And he started out shooting with Nikon before he made the transition to Fujifilm X series about 10 or 11 years ago, back when the X system first started out. So I wanted to have him come on the show and talk about the Fujifilm X-Series camera platform. And uh, just to let you know, he is also the very first ex-ambassador for Fuji. So it's really a big honor and privilege to have him on the show. All right, now I'm going to bring Dan on with me and let's talk about Fujifilm X-Series. All right, so as I promised my audience, I'm now talking with Dan Bailey. He is a travel outdoor adventure photographer based out of uh, Anchorage, Alaska. Dan, welcome to the show. Thank you, Liam. It's great to be a guest on the show. Absolutely. And I, I'm thrilled to have you on here. Um, I've, I've been looking at your photography. It's absolutely amazing. I've been watching your pod or your YouTube videos. Uh, those are really great. So if you don't mind, let's start out with, uh, tell my audience a little bit about your background, how you got started in photography, and we'll go from there. Okay. Yeah, I um, I bought my first camera while I was in college. Uh, I'd, I'd had little cameras when I was a kid, like my my dad uh, had loaned me, or you know, like my parents had given me a little Kodak Instamatic, one of those old Kodaks that looks like an ice cream sandwich. Yeah, I know what you mean. That's how I got started. Yeah. And so I had one of those when I was, I think I was in high school when I had that. Because I remember I take, I took that on my Outward Bound trip uh, when I was 18. And before then, I probably messed around uh, with Instamatics. I made a pinhole camera in second grade, which didn't work at all. We put a roll of film, and I think I just way overexposed everything. Ah, oh, geez. Uh, but I was intrigued, you know, because we kind of made that thing ourselves. and. But when I was in uh, college, oh yeah, and then high school, I hung out with my friend in the dark room, and I would skip classes and stuff. <laughs> so because he was in a photography class. But anyway, when I would, I went to college um, at Berkeley College of Music in Boston, and when I was at the school there, I had a work study job at the front desk, and so that gave me a little bit of extra money. And I don't know exactly what it was that that propelled me, but I just all of a sudden decided I wanted to buy a real camera and get into it uh, more seriously, and, you know, just as a hobby then. But I, yep. I walked around uh, Boston and Cambridge looking at all kinds of different camera stores and looking at different models. And I settled on February 2nd, 1990. I bought a Nikon FM2 chrome body and a 50 millimeter 1.4 lens. And that was my first start. Oh, sweet. And so that, yeah, they, yeah. So last month I hit my thirty-year mark. Uh, no, thirty-two year. Yeah, nineteen ninety. Yeah. So my thirty-year mark, thirty-two year mark as a, as a photographer. Oh, cool. And I started just shooting prints. You know, Kodak rolls of Kodak Gold that I have processed at Star Market. And and when I was later that summer, in the summer of nineteen, I guess probably nineteen ninety one. Yeah, it would have been early 1991, middle of 91. Someone forwarded me uh, an article that Galen Rowell had written, you know, an outdoor photographer magazine that they clipped out, sent to me. So I read that and I was instantly hooked because I didn't know who he was, but that instantly uh, appealed to me. 
from his style uh, of not just photography, but adventuring as well. And so uh, later that summer, my friend and I went, we, we took a 40 day road trip around the West, around the American West. And for that, I started shooting slide film and I shot, shot like 40 rolls of Kodachrome and, oh. and just shot landscapes. We would drive places and shoot landscapes and things like that. We drove to the Badlands and Death Valley and the Grand Canyon and all these notable places, uh, Joshua Tree, all these really notable places uh, in, the, in the Western U.S. And then the next summer, let's see, it was, that was 91. So two years later, fast forward a little bit, when I had graduated from Berkeley, uh, and so it was the summer of 92, uh, and, and so maybe fall of 92, by that time I had run out of money and I was living at home with my mom. And, and, and I was really intrigued by photography, and I wasn't, when I graduated from Berkeley, I was in some ways more intrigued by photography than actually getting a career in the music business which I didn't quite think through what that would look like. I really <laughs> loved music and I re- actually made it in rec- majored in recording engineering and music production. Oh, okay. Uh, but what I didn't really think through carefully was the kinds of jobs that you get with those careers, either have you sitting in like smoky bars at night or windowless recording studios. Yeah. And I was an outdoor guy. So that the more I thought about it, that didn't really appeal to me. But I also didn't want to just go back to school for photography. So I just pursued it as a hobby. And then, like I said, kind of around maybe fall of 92, I saw an ad in Outdoor Photographer Magazine for a workshop trip, a workshop, a, a workshop trek with Galen Rao in this region of northern Nepal that had just been opened to Westerners. It had been closed for years. Oh, you know, cool. It had never been opened to Westerners before. And so I immediately signed up for that and maxed out all my credit cards. And I went on that trip in the spring of 93. And that was kind of my, my first really big adventure. It was my first time out of the country, in fact, out of the U.S. I was 23 years old. No, I was 25 years old. And so that was incredibly educational. I got to you know, meet Galen and learn from him. And the next summer I went, I did a trek. Uh, I signed on to do a, an adventure travel trip uh, with a, it was actually put on by a, an international mountain climber who would get people to trek to base camp with the climbers to help you know, defray costs for yep, the climbing yep. trip. And so we trekked to, we, we, it was a trek up the Baltoro Glacier in the Karakoram Mountains of Pakistan, oh, which wow. are pretty much the, you know, Galen Rao's book, The Throne Room of the Mountain Gods. That's exactly the region. So it's one of the most impressive mountain regions on the entire planet. Yeah, I can imagine. So by then I'm shooting Fuji film because Galen had shot, you know, he showed, introduced us all to Velvia. And so I had a whole, I had like 80 rolls of Velvia and Provia. And I shot tons of photos during that trip. And so that's how I got into photography. Um, yeah. but And those were the two big trips that really propelled me and made me realize, yeah, this is what I want to do for a career. Um, and also just, you know, showed me how much passion i had for outdoor photography that's awesome i mean that that is so cool you've gone to some really cool places <laughs> i'm jealous because most of the traveling i did outside the u.s was while i was an army ranger so <laughs> oh, wow. didn't get to do a whole lot of sightseeing and taking pictures while i was doing that uh but that's so cool and uh and i would like you um i've been doing photography for a little over 30 years um, I mean, I dabbled with it as a little kid. One of my uncles gave me one of those ice cream sandwich Kodak cameras when I was like five <laughs> or six years old. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, I screwed around, run around the yard taking pictures. And as I got a little bit older, I'd do pictures at our family reunions and stuff like that. And then in my early teens, I moved up to a 35 millimeter, you know, film camera. And uh, once it came out, man, I was, inst- I started using it. I really fell in love with Fuji's Provia and Velvia film stock it was just i it was just something about it i absolutely loved their color science has always been really amazing to me and uh that's one of the reasons uh in addition to my arm issues that i recently switched to the fuji x series is uh, i just love the film simulations they do such a great job of digitally reproducing that film stock the look of that old film stock 
They and really they, do. Yeah, and it's yeah. just incredible. So let me ask you, because I know you started out with Nikon. So what? how did you end up transitioning to the Fuji X series? Go ahead and, and, and t- tell my audience about that, because you got a great story. Like I said, I've been watching your YouTube videos, and yeah. it's just awesome. I'd love to hear that story. Yeah, well, everybody should just go watch my videos. I don't even need to t- say it all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so I was, you know, I'd had that Nikon FM2. That was my first camera. That was my first real camera. And I grew, you know, and in part I was, well, I, I bought that camera before I knew about Galen. Uh, but, but being a Nikon shooter, you know, it was certainly influenced in part, uh, in a large part since, since he was a Nikon shooter. So even, so when I, by the time I was, you know, much more serious and knowledgeable about it, I would kind of follow his trends and be influenced by him. And so I progressed from the FM2, uh, and I had that for quite a while. Um, in nineteen, in this, in the fall of '95, I moved. So the, the Nepal trip was '93. The Pakistan trip was '94. In the fall of '95, I decided to move to Colorado, which was actually my home state. That's where I was born. Oh, cool! But I decided to move back to Colorado because I really wanted to be an adventure photographer and shoot action sports and adventure and, and that's that the place to do it. And Boston didn't really have that kind of thing. Yeah. And, absolutely. and that was the place to do it. And so I moved to Fort Collins, Colorado and got a job as a digital scanning tech at a, a photo lab that, that, uh, produced photo CDs, codex photo CD format. Oh, okay, cool. And so I was scanning images to, to Kodak photo CD. And that was my, my job. Um, so that was the fall of 95. So I had that job for a year and on October 4th, 1996, my boss fired me, let me go. And I panicked for a couple hours, uh, maybe a day. But then I realized that was my moment to try to make it as a photographer and, and back up a little bit when I was living in Boston after I graduated, I had some different jobs, but the last job I had was actually working at a stock photo agency. Uh, I was the assistant editor. And so that gave me a real insight into how the photo industry works. And I would get to meet you know, professional photographers and talk to them. But just, I, I, you know, I had an a understanding of how the stock photo industry works and just how photos are bought and sold and negotiated and prices and usage rates and stuff. And so when I got fired, I was like, okay, this is my chance. I'm going to start shooting a whole bunch of stock and, and, and sell it and try to get assignments and get it into agencies. And I know how to do this. Yeah. That'd be and cool. so, so I did. And I was able to, with that knowledge and with my emerging skills and my tenacity, I was able to make it as a pro photographer and become kind of one of the up and coming names during that time, during the kind of mid to late nineties. That's so cool. And, and so you'd ask me about Nikon. So the first, one of the first things I did when I got laid off my day job from that job, I, and I decided, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to be a pro photographer. I went home, uh, and I pulled out my credit card and I maxed them out and bought a Nikon N90 and and then three lenses. I think I've got the 24, 24, two, eight, uh, the, uh, I think I bought a, the less expensive zoom. No, I think I maxed it all out. Yeah. Cause I'd had up to that point, I'd been collecting Nikon gear a little bit. And so I think by then I probably had the 24. That's right. So I think I ordered the N90, uh, the 80 to 200 and SB 26 flash. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, or maybe a 25, there. maybe a 25. I can't remember if it was a 25 or 26, um, but I get the 26 shortly after anyway. But so that was kind of my, you know, that was my big purchase. That was like three grand, three, three and a half grand of just boom, right? Like that. Um, took a while to pay it off, but cause I was poor out, poor photographer living in a basement apartment, but I didn't have any, many expenses and I was super frugal. Um, but so, yeah, so I had that Nikon gear for quite a long time. And eventually uh, went digital in 2008 when my photo lab closed. My friend was, he ran the lab that I would use. 
in Fort Collins, and he closed the lab when he finally couldn't, you know, keep keep it going anymore. And so I was like, okay, I guess it's time for me too. So I went home and ordered a Nikon D two hundred, and and then some software, bought some software, and and ordered memory cards and stuff. So that was when I went digital in two thousand eight, in spring, and. And I just, you know, went on as a happy Nikon shooter, D200, D300, D700. And it was the, uh, it was the fall of 2011 when my Fuji journey officially started. Uh, I had, you know, we talked about shooting Fuji films, you know, and just being in love with these color profiles like Velvia and Astia. And, and actually, Sensia was the, the, consumer version of Astia, so you could get it for three dollars a roll yeah exactly Bellevue didn't Bellevue didn't have a consumer version so that was 850 a roll so you'd have to pay full price for that yep but i would shoot these fuji films um and then of course when i went digital you, there was no more film but in the fall of 2011 uh i had uh, earlier that year i'd kind of had a uh some my, i started straining the muscles of my forearm with my heavy camera shooting one-handed and stuff yeah i understand that yeah, and so that was just kind of nagging me, and I had no ideas that I was going to ever switch or anything. I I felt pretty beholden to Nikon just because I had a good history with them. I had, was in no hurry to switch or anything. But I was at Photo Plus Trade Show in October 2011, and I, on my way out the door, because I was there for three days and then I had to quickly run out to go to Penn Station to catch my flight back to Alaska. And on my last day at the show, I just just happened by the Fuji booth and I just ran by and I was like, Oh, these guys. And I'd read in the, like the show magazine, I'd read about Fuji film and the rec series and the X 100, which had been announced, which had been released earlier that year. And I was like, well, I want to go check it out. It's pretty cool. You know, I don't need a range range finder cameras, not really my, my wheelhouse. I'm like a Nikon SLR guy. Yeah. Yeah. But but there it was. And I was like, hey, Fuji booth, I'll check it out. I mean, I use Fuji, Fuji film, so why not? And the first thing I saw on the table there was the little X10. And it just immediately captured my heart. I was like, oh, my God, this is the most darling little camera I've ever seen. <laughs> and I picked it up. <laughs> the thing is so cute. And I picked it up. And when I, the, the rep who was at the table showed me how to turn it on. Because it has an interesting way to turn it on. You, you spin the zoom, little zoom barrel on the lens. Oh, wow. There's I didn't no know switch. That. Yeah, there's no switch on the on the on the X10 and 20. You just turn you you open you take the lens cap off and you just turn. You can see the off switch on the barrel, so you just turn it to the zoom one of the zoom numbers oh, and that turns okay. the camera on. And so he when he showed me that, uh, the next thing he showed me was the menu that had the film simulations. Actually, it was a function button. Press the bu function button, and the actual logos for Velvia and Provia and Astia were right there. They yep. had used those in the camera. Yeah. And that blew me away. I was like, oh my God. And he showed me the, you know, how to switch those and and the effect on the when you look through the viewfinder. Or when you looked at the L C D screen when you took a picture. And I it blew me away. And I was like, oh my God, this camera is so cute. It's like a real camera, little tiny camera. And it has these like real Fuji film simulations from the films that I had shot before. And the way I think about films like Velvia is those color profiles, were like the defining elements of my emerging photo career as a creative artist. So those colors like baked into my soul. Yeah. I can and, understand that for sure. Yeah. I mean, I dream in Velvia. I, you know, <laughs> I, I just see, that's how I see the world. My, like my brain is, my whole creative brain is calibrated towards these film profiles. And so I was so excited. I immediately went back to Alaska, ordered one, and I just fell in love with it. So I shot with the X10 for a year, and the X20 came out uh, about almost a year and a half later. And it was about six or eight months after I shot, first had the X10. Uh, I decided to reach out to Fujifilm because I'd shot all these photos that I loved with it. And they were my, one of my clients at one point in the late, like the late nineties and early two thousands, they would somehow I got on their list and they would send me requests for photos to be used for trade show prints. That is so and cool. And so, uh, 
Yeah, so I would package my best dance. You know, send us two pictures or send us your favorite picture shot on Fuji film. And so I would package my best slides up, you know, and send them off. And they got used twice. I had two pictures used by them, one in 99 and one in 2000. And I still have one of the prints from, you know, after the, the show was over, they would send me the prints. And one was a huge 30 by 40 of this mountain biker on this mountain ridge. And then the other one was uh, a sunrise on Long's Peak and Rocky Mountain National Park. And I still have that one. That's a, it was like a 24 by 36 or something. And so anyway, I decided to reach out to them. And I said, hey, I'm Dan. You know, you guys used my pictures before. I love the X10 so much. And here's what I'm doing with it. And they were psyched. And they reached out to me. And they answered me. And they, we started a dialogue. And eventually that led to them you know, bringing me in and, and uh, let me try out the XE1 when it first came out. Uh, and then in late, late 2013, uh, I was at photo plus trade show and I was introduced to a man named Yuji who was, had just come over from the Japan office and he was going to be one of the new people in the, in the Fujifilm North America office. And he, he had known my work. They had, you know, introduced my work to him. So when we met, you know, I, I told him, I said, I, I love these cameras that you're making, but I'm, I'm an action shooter. I'm, I need cameras that I can, you know, beat up and they can be weather sealed and, and they need to be fast action, super fast autofocus. And he said, well, we have something that we think you want to see. And that, uh, that was the X10. That was the XT1. And so I actually got to try the XT1 before it was even announced. And when it was fully, fully when it was announced, I was the first U.S. photographer to get one and shoot with it. That is and so. So, cool. so I was like the guy who broke the XT1 to Amer to the North American world, oh, so English speaking. Cool. You know. And so they made me an X photographer. They were developing that program, so they made me one of the first U.S. X photographers. And I, so I'm just one of their, with now what they call the legacy X photographers, and uh, because I was one of the first, and so I have a great relationship with them. Uh, I. Yeah, I'm. I love their cameras, and I try my best to beat them up and destroy them. And and uh, but they they deliver. They, you know, they. When I in that video series, so for your viewers or your listeners, I'm celebrating my 10 year anniversary or 10 year run of using the Fujifilm X series cameras on my YouTube channel, which is Dan Bailey Photo, and I'm just celebrating, you know, the history of of how this has all developed with my own career and when this is meant for me, but also the celebration of how this affected the industry as well. You know, the innovations that Fujifilm had put across in these new cameras, just as mirrorless was an emerging technology at the time. And so as I, it just, yeah. So everybody should watch those videos. Oh yeah. We'll share them in the show notes yeah. for this episode. Yep. Absolutely. But, but one of the things that I do mention was in in, uh, I don't know, maybe 2013, the product manager at the time had been interviewed by, uh, I can't remember who it was, but, but they had asked her about the X-Series and how it came about. And she said, well, we were listening to pros, and there were a lot of pro photographers who were saying, you know, we carry around this heavy DSLR gear all day long, our Nikons and Canons, and it would be really nice to have a small light camera that we could use on our own time to shoot photos that we like in our free time, you know, on vacation, our families, just, you know, walking around, just exercise our own personal creativity. And that's how the X100 came about. Oh, that's and cool. So, so they, when, where a lot of companies at the time were trying to get the consumer market <laughs> because consumer market was like being stolen by the iPhone. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I would go to photo plus, and walk around the New York trade show all day long for the whole weekend and just see cameras and cameras and cameras and cameras and big cameras and small cameras and cameras. And then I'd go to Times Square at night and I'd see 10,000 people shooting with their iPhones and not a camera in sight. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was like the one, the, like the one art student, the one art school kid who was like got a Pentax on his tripod. Yeah. Like long exposure. Yeah, the smartphone camera definitely killed the point and shoot industry big time. Yeah, and and so the funny thing is that Kodak saw this coming, and so they tried to, well, even before digital, they tried to save 
film, like the last gasp of saving film before everybody went digital, they came out with this new cartridge format called APSC. And it was this, it was the Advantix, their Advantix brand. And there was basically a film point and shoot that instead of loading a roll of film and having to like spool the roll across, yep. you just load this little cartridge in. And the APSC, depending on how you set the camera, could be cropped on the piece of film and processed as either like an APSC H size, uh, an APS, an, an APS H, which was like you know high resolution, which is like the full the full frame of that piece of film. Oh, okay. The C, which was I, I don't remember what it stood for, and then panorama, something like that. And the ironic thing was that when the digital photography, when the digital camera revolution came along, it was the APS-C size format that was chosen for a lot of these sensors. And so that's how, that's what AP, where APS-C comes from. And so Fuji chose that because it offered, it was bigger than micro four thirds and it offered more image quality and better noise reduction and higher resolution than the, the smaller micro four thirds sensor size but it not still saves size and weight over a DSLR and 35 millimeter. Yeah, exactly. What we could solve full frame. Yep. And so when, where a lot of the companies were trying to capture the consumer market back from iPhones, uh, Fuji from the very beginning went after the pros and the serious enthusiasts, you know, people who love photography and love cameras as much as they love, you know, just taking pictures for fun. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the things I love about Fuji is the fact that, uh, to be, I, there's no better way to put it. Their cameras are just gorgeous. They're beautiful, um, and maybe it's yeah. because I'm an old geezer. <laughs> you know, I'm 51. Um, I just love the fact that so 51. many. 51. Their... <laughs> You're young. Tom. I just been 54. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just so funny because it, it's just so elegant that so many of their cameras look like the film cameras that I fell in love with when I was younger. That's what yeah. one of the biggest things I absolutely love about their platform. And I yeah, find- and that's that's why that's exactly what they went for. They in between the camera design and the softwares, they reached back into their legacy of lens design and and traditional cameras, and their long legacy with film. So the X series is basically a, a meld of this traditional old legacy technology that had produced so much, that had you know garnered so much passion in the previous decades and then you add in the the software and the high-tech components of the modern era and you have these well that's what the x-series is (laughs) yeah exactly and uh i i could be wrong um but if i remember correctly i think i read an article it might have been on fuji rumors that the gentleman that originally created their film stock their 35 millimeter film stock is still with the company, and he actually developed the film simulations for them. That's why the digitally the digital version is so perfectly reproducing the original film stock because the same guy invented both. Yeah, I do know that that there are legacy. Uh, I do know that some of the guys who were still on the team uh, and who developed some of those profiles uh, were were involved in the initial film simulations. And you, one of the guys had told me, one of the product managers had told me one time, because I asked about the film simulations, because it's such a great thing. It's so innovative. And a lot of cameras, like Nikons and stuff, they had, you know, vivid mode or landscape mode. Yeah, exactly. But these were specific film profiles, which is brilliant, because so many people are familiar with those colors. And he said that when they were developing the X100, some of the engineers was like, no, nah, we don't need that. And some of them were like, no, we should really include this. And so it's fortunate for us that those guys won out and they were ten- tenacious yeah. in their drive to make sure that stuff was included in the X series. Yeah, that was an absolutely wise decision. And one of the things that intrigues me so much about the X series is I believe the, like you said, the very first X series camera was the X100, which is at the X100 line for my listeners that don't know is actually, you could technically say it's a point and shoot because it has a 23 millimeter lens that you can't change. It doesn't remove. But other than that, it has all of the same hardware and software as like the XT series, which is just crazy. 
Yeah, the X100 is a, a single lens rangefinder in the style of like a Leica or a, you know one of those contacts or something. Um, and that's why it was so revered by photojournalists and street shooters and travel photographers. But you're right, the uh, the X100 was you know fixed lens camera had all the same features, and that continues today. And that's one of the great things about the X series is is like every, almost every setting, almost every camera, the settings are common to, to all of the models. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They're, they're, I would say that 90% of the settings in an X-series camera are common to every other model that's available today. Exactly. Uh, and, it, and, and it's not just the X-series. It's the GFX line as well. Yeah, I have the GFX right. 50R. That was the first Fujifilm uh, digital camera that I bought. I got that a couple of years ago for my documentary work. And then when I got the X-series, I was like, holy crap, it's the same menu, same software, same dial, same everything. I was like, this is yeah, awesome. I, you're right. And that's the funny thing is, so I have a book called X-Series Unlimited. Yep, that's, exactly. It's basically a guide to the X-Series. And I don't specifically target it towards GFX users. I, it, it's mostly, it's, you know, it's called X-Series Unlimited. But it's, it's totally applicable to the, X, to the GFX as well. Because like I said, it's all the same menus, all the same function buttons, all the same camera settings and creative settings that are common to both systems. Yep, and, and I absolutely and so, love that. And, and there are settings inside the original X100 that are still being used. They're still on every model. Yeah, because, and that's the cool thing. Yeah, because there are settings that the people using these cameras want. That's one of the things I give props to Fuji and Sony both for. They seem to listen to the people using their cameras more than any other camera companies on the market. I mean, yeah. I see that all the time. I hear it all the time. I read about it in stories all the time. You know, where Fuji or Sony, they'll actually go to people that are shooting their platform and say, hey, what is it you like about it? What is it you don't like? What would you like us yeah. to add? And then they respond in kind either in a new gener in a future generation of the hardware or by adding it in a firmware update, which is just incredible. Yeah, the firmware updates, uh, even, even back then, so that uh, I just turned on my X10 here. And this camera is introduced in 2011, and and I'm just flipping through the menu here, and I see uh, dynamic range menu, or dynamic range, film simulation, color sharpness, highlight tone, shadow tone, noise reduction, face detection, AF mode, all these creative display custom setting, all these creative settings that are still in use on the X series, and so even the X10 got a firmware update early on, and 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 that's one of the cool things is that the they can, like a DSLR, all the components are fixed, or most of the components are fixed. Yeah, absolutely. They're they're fixed hardware components, so you can't really increase autofocus performance on a DSLR. You have to wait for the next model, which has an updated mechanism inside it, the new technology. But mirrorless cameras and today's di digital cameras are software based uh, with so much of it, and so they can update that stuff. And so Fujifilm has been really, they've they've been very kind of revolutionary in terms of updating the cameras, not just incrementally, but like the X, the very first firmware for the XT1, which came out a, about a year after it was, had been already out, it, it gave the camera 27 new features. Holy and cow. And these were serious features, including a brand new, radically updated autofocus system. Oh, that is cool. And so, so. So everybody who had the X10, the XT1, a year later they could get a free update that gave essentially gave them a brand new camera, exactly. and it was called the XT1, just with a new firmware update. And so uh, it, so anybody that has an X series camera should continue to update their firmware, even if you have an old model, because e even though a lot of the new features won't go into the older models, especially the really older models, because a lot of the new features, whenever. Whenever like a brand new X series camera comes out, like XT4 comes out, has a new film simulation called the Eternal Bleach Bypass or Classic Neg or something, those aren't going to be filtered backwards too far, if if at all, because a lot of those are processor dependent. You know, with a fa every generation has a faster processor, which allows the Fuji engineers to create faster and more powerful algorithms for these film simulations yeah, and things exactly. like autofocus. Yep. But at the same time. 
they still update the older cameras to make them to give them better compatibility with the newer lenses and flashes and stuff. Yeah, which is fantastic. That, that's some, yeah. And uh, I believe that was a, I don't know if they still use it or not. I've heard talk that they've kind of moved away from that. But I know, I guess, internally at Fuji, that was like, uh, it was a program called Kaizen or something like that, where basically they would, for every camera, they would release a firmware update that just radically upgraded the camera's capabilities like once a year or whatever the case may be. And I know when the X-T4 came out, um, the biggest differences between the X-T3 and 4 was mostly like the IBIS and stuff like that. But then I don't know how long it was after the X-T4 came out, Fuji released a major firmware update for the X-T3 that gave it all of the same capabilities as the 4, you know, minus the IBIS, which was a mechanical thing or a hardware yeah, it didn't, thing. It, yeah, it didn't have the eternal bleach bypass. It didn't have the stuff that required the faster processor, but for everything else, uh, it it did, yeah. It gave it basically gave the XT3 the exact same autofocus algorithms that the XT4 had, and, and some other new features as well. Yeah, which is so cool. And I yeah. I know uh, one of the systems I've always dreamed of owning, and I'll probably never be able to afford one, is one of the Hasselblad digital systems. One of their, I'm not talking oh, yeah. like the X, uh, I'm not talking about the X1D50C. I'm talking about one of their real cameras, like the the H6D 100C or whatever. That You know, the ones that are like 100 grand. And uh, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a photographer one time about it. And he's like, why would you want to buy a camera that's that expensive? And I said, well, you got to <laughs> understand, Hasselblad's, Hasselblad's newest cameras are mostly software. So if you buy one of those cameras for $100,000, they keep releasing new versions of the software for it. You could buy that one camera and use it for 30, 40, 50 years because they constantly add new features and functionality and it's all software-based. And that's the same thing we have now with mirrorless yeah. cameras. That is one of the, the tricky things about this modern technology era is that, is that stuff becomes obsolete. And, and so the Kaizen mentality that Fujifilm had put forward in the early years of the X-Series, you know, the, the idea behind that was that, you know, I, I'm an ex-photographer, I'm a pro photographer, so I update my models more often than the average person, yep. the average shooter. Exactly. And so I, I get a lot of emails from people and comments uh, that people are still using their X-T1s and X-T2s and the X-E1s, and they're still loving these cameras. And that's awesome because Fujifilm wants people to buy a camera and use it for years and love it and have it be a part of them, just like your favorite musical instrument that, that you just resonates with you so much. Exactly. That, you know, gets beat up and you customize it and you get a you know cool strap for it and you and you wear off the brass and you know wear down the metal to the bare brass on the buttons and the dials and it becomes yours. And they want people to enjoy that for years. They they obviously have to chase the technology because that's just the way the world works and the industry works. But that doesn't mean that just because the X-T4 came out, the X-T1 is now obsolete. Because that, that 16 millimeter X-Trans sensor, that second generation X-Trans sensor, made beautiful looking images. I, I was talking to a guy on a com who made a comment on my YouTube the other day, and he says he still prefers the look of the X-E1 images, where that first generation 16 millimeter X-Trans sensor, so the X-Pro1 and X-E1 had that. Oh, wow. And he just uh, loves the way those images look. Yep. And, you know, there are slight color improvements or just changes in how the cameras and sensors, you know, uh, perform with terms of color rendition from each generation to the next. And some people are just still in love with, with those first and second generation x trans sensors. And that's awesome because there's no reason you have to buy a new camera because th the reality is that for what most people need and the uses that most people need, you don't, you know, there's the, the difference in a, a 24 megapixel sensor versus 16 is negligible. And even if you were going to like have a picture printed on a poster or a billboard, viewing distance is always relative to image size. So it's not like you're going to look at it really close and go, oh, I see pixels. I see pixelation. 
Yeah, we exactly. need the bigger sensor. Yep. And it's <laughs> yeah. funny because one of my favorite groups, uh, I'm not a huge fan of Facebook. I, I really don't care it, for it as a platform. Yeah. But one of my favorite groups on there is actually a Fujifilm. It's, uh, I can't remember the exact title, but it's like uh, Fujifilm X1, X2, X3, X4 group. And yeah. There are so many folks in that, and I think it's got like 50,000 members or something like that. And there are so many people in that group that are posting photographs every day or at least every week that are using, still using X-T1s and X-T2s, and their images are just absolutely amazing. And these people are yeah. like, yeah, I've got no desire to upgrade. I've had the X-T1 since it first came out. It suits my needs. I, I keep using it. When yeah, one, you know, when one mechanically fails on me, I find another one and keep shooting with that same model. Yeah, and so those cameras have held value. I heard from somebody that XE ones are actually quite expensive on the second market right now. Yeah, they are actually. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah, and Fuji wants that, and that's really awesome to hear that from people. I, yeah. I, when I when I started when I first started this video series, my retrospective, I grabbed my X twenty, and so I took that out shooting for a couple of couple of afternoons and i had a great time with it and i got some really fun images and i re just remembered how much fun that little camera was and and how great the images still look from it and the funny thing you know the x the x10 and 20 had a sensor the size of my pinky nail and i actually sold a picture to be used as a four by six foot duratrans to a corporate client one time oh cool right in their lobby there's a hospital lobby here in anchorage oh that's so and cool it was a, a three. It was basically a three megabyte straight JPEG out of the X10 of a landscape, you know, Velvia mode, and and I didn't feel quite comfortable just giving them an X, you know, three megabyte file, so I pulled it into Photoshop and upsized it by like four hundred percent, and then saved it as a hundred twenty megabyte, hundred thirty megabyte TIFF file, but it was really the same image. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, yeah. something that's interesting, because um, I've played around before with upsizing photos in Photoshop, and I've since stopped using Adobe software just because, in my personal opinion, Capture One does a better job of processing Fuji files. Um, but I know downsizing an image in Photoshop, no problem. Upsizing is where you can run into problems because of the fact that you're trying to extrapolate more data from the original file than was right. there to begin with. Now, one of the things that's interesting, and I haven't tried it yet, and I'm almost certain they offer a, like a 30-day trial, is I've heard a lot of really good things about Topaz Labs. They have a program, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but this specifically designed to upsize photographs from a smaller resolution to a higher resolution without any degradation in the file or the image itself. So in other words, um, I read an article the other day where uh, a shooter took one of his images that was like 4,000 pixels on the long, you know, long ways, um, and he upsized it to like 16,000 pixels yeah. on the long edge. And it looked just as great as it did at 4,000. I mean, there was no degradation in the image at all, which just totally blew my mind. Because I don't, yeah. think, I don't think you can go four times the size in Photoshop and not really jack up the photo. Yeah, and um, I is does Topaz is that the one? It's called Perfect Resize. Uh, no, it's, it's called Gigapixel company. AI. Okay. Gig, Who Gigapixel makes AI. Resize? Yep, that's the one. Gigapixel Who AI did? is the one that does it. Who does the Perfect Resize? Um, I can't remember. I have heard of that program, unless maybe that was one of their earlier software versions. Because now they've renamed a lot of their stuff since they've gone to using AI algorithms and all that stuff. So that might have been like an earlier version of the software, because I do know what you're talking about. And mm -hmm. I almost think that was one of theirs. And I think when they started doing all the AI-based stuff, they renamed a lot of their stuff. And they just instead went to Gigapixel AI is what they call it now. I but I, this, but I maybe, think it's the same was general on idea. One. Yeah. Yeah, I, but yeah, I mean, upsizing uh, the technology is so good these days. So yeah, it's absolutely incredible. And uh, now the one thing that always kills me uh, when other people talk about Fujifilm's cameras, like yeah. Canon shooters and the Nike, I've never been the type that poo poos anybody's cameras. I don't. I tell everybody all the time, I don't care what you shoot with. Every camera on the market today makes great images. Most it's all most all of them make great videos as well. It's just that yeah, each brand, true. yeah, it's that each brand has its own strengths and weaknesses. And what I hear all the time that kills me from 
Sony, Canon, and Nikon shooters, and I used to be a Canon shooter, is, oh, well, Fujifilm, oh, they're a joke. They're not going to go anywhere. Yeah, they want to be like number one. They're never going to get... Fuji's not trying to be the number one camera brand on the planet. It's like you said, they're trying to build a lifetime legacy with each customer. They want yeah, you to exactly. use that camera for years and years to come. Yeah, and they obviously have to have to compete. Yep, exactly. And, and have good sales so they can keep their selves funded and keep making cameras, which they are doing. They 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 keep doing well even in the pandemic when yep. slowdowns and 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 backlogs and stuff. They continue to perform and and make cameras and ship them and yeah they've been doing amazingly well yeah. and for a long time because i've never i haven't always been a, a pro paid shooter um for years i did you know just my own stuff i did family stuff i've done some weddings paid weddings but usually only for family or close friends because frankly to me weddings are just a nightmare <laughs> um, yeah i've shot a couple i, I think i've shot two maybe three but just for friends yeah and for no no pay exactly and <laughs> uh, favors and uh for many years when i was just doing photography for myself i would just buy like a high-end point and shoot like one of the top of the line fuji fine picks or something like that some along that line um yeah. I, can't, I can't remember all the models but i tended to always stick with the fujis and then when i was getting my my first uh photography degrees i went to the art institute um i did it online through their pittsburgh campus uh that was back when they were still around they uh, had a partnership with bnh and the camera kit that they got for or they sent all the students by default was a t a canon t3i so that's how i got into using the canons more on the interchangeable lens side and then more recently because of the issues with my arm I, uh, arms i decided to go to fuji and it wasn't like a rash de decision i was like you i like eased into it a little bit at a time uh because i wasn't 100 percent sure i wanted to totally commit but then as i used my gfx 50r more and more i really fell in love with the whole fuji experience and the film simulations and everything else and uh so then i just finally took the plunge and i got i traded in all my canon rf gear and got all fuji x gear i've got two xt 4 I've got an XE4 and I've currently got five lenses. I need to get some more. Um, and I haven't been able to buy all Fuji lenses. I bought some third party lenses just because money was a bit tight right now. Um, but I'm not regretting it at all. I mean, I, I had rented the XT bodies before uh, from lens rentals and gone out and shot and shot with them for a couple of weeks at a time and really loved what I was getting from them. So I decided it was finally time to pull the trigger. My doctor was like, look, your arms are beat up really bad from all, the year. <laughs> all those years of dragging around a, a, you know, a 1D flagship body with a four or 600 millimeter, you know, F2 uh -huh. or F4 lens. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, he's like, you got to go to either a smaller, lighter system or you're going to have to give photography up. And I said, well, giving up photography is not going to happen. There's no way that's going to happen. And um, and I'd been listening to Sharky James on the Petapixel photography podcast and he had the same issues i did he and i are right about the same age his birthday is a couple months before mine and he was a photojournalist for 20 plus years and like me he was lugging around flagship nikon bodies and those huge lenses you know the big heavy 28 and f4 lenses to do his photojournalism work and he has the same problems i do he has arm issues like crazy and so I don't know how long he's been with using Fuji, but I know he switched, I think, five or six years ago to Fuji, uh, or maybe it's seven or eight now. I know it was shortly after he, he retired from photojournalism that he finally decided to switch to Fuji. He still had some of his Nikon gear, but he never shot with it. Um, yeah. And he says now the only camera he still has, I think, is a D850. It's either a D700 or a D850. And he's like, I'll never sell it. I'll never get rid of it. I'm just going to keep it as a memento because it was one of my all-time favorite Nikon cameras that they ever made. So he still has that body, but all the, you know, everything that he shoots with now is X series. And he's, you know, yeah. like me and you, he's absolutely loving it just because the it's small, compact, the lenses are considerably lighter and less expensive in many ways. And uh, it's just so much fun to shoot with. I love listening to him tell stories about how much he enjoys, you know, and, and like you mentioned in your videos, you know, you go out on the street, do street photography, which I love to do. It's one of my favorite genres, especially when I lived in Atlanta. And a Fuji camera around your neck turns heads. 
especially if you got one of the black and silver editions, because then everybody's like, man, that's a cool looking camera. And people will come over yeah. and start talking to you about it just because of how beautiful and elegant the camera itself looks. Yeah. And we started to see them in, uh, it's funny. Sometimes we can spot them in TV shows and, and movies and stuff. Yeah, exactly. And, and yeah. it's funny because a lot of your more recent Hollywood movies, at least the stills work for the movies, are being shot on X-Series bodies. I see stories about it all the yeah. time on the Fuji Rumors site. And, yeah, uh, when, that, when the X-T3 came out, it, was, it had remarkably good video capabilities. And in fact, to, to market the X-T3... Um, they let me make sure that it was uh i'm pretty sure it was next t3 um to market that they one of the there they have a, a tech rep out on the west coast and so he he has inroads with a lot of the movie people uh, just because that's the industry he is in and so he uh he worked with a production team and a director and they made like a full-fledged very short but full-fledged movie and you would see they had stills of the set and you would see this giant this giant apparatus of it, all this you know connectors and and inputs and audio and, and hdmi's out and, and external monitors and gyros and and tucked tucked deep inside all this stuff is a little fuji you know fuji x-series body <laughs> and i'm pretty sure it was the xt3 yeah, I've and, seen and it, I've seen some crazy pictures like that on yeah. Hollywood sets of, you know, like Fuji or even some of them I've seen sometimes were like Sony cameras where it's like just this really incredibly small and compact yeah. camera that's then got a ton of crap added on to it yeah. that you got to have to so shoot a X, movie. And so the X-T3 was the first camera that I started shooting video seriously with. I'm, I was a holdout. I, and I, for the most part, I, I do, I do some video for the most part. It's, for me, uh, one of my favorite things lately is to do just make sh video shorts and then score them to original music because I'm still doing music after you know with my music production knowledge. But I I had an assignment uh, doing video for uh, a, a famous, a really well known mountain biker and cyclist, and she came to Alaska to, to do one of our winter ultra endurance races. So I followed her uh, with the producer, and I followed her. Um, leapfrogging between checkpoints and then videoing when she came in and out of checkpoints and then the finish line. And so the XP3 was the first one. That was the first X series that I really started using video on a much more serious level. And I get, you know, had a microphone um, and I had the, the vertical battery grip and, and I'm continuing to shoot video with the XT4. In fact, most of my YouTube videos uh, all of my YouTube videos have either been shot with the X-T3 or X-T4. And in the past, almost past year, all X-T4, just using the flip screen, flipped out. I actually have an external monitor, HDMI monitor, that I would put on top of the X-T3. And it's awesome. It's like an 8-inch wide monitor. But now that the X-T4 has a flip-out screen, which I don't love for stills, it's, I, I much prefer the X-T123 style of flip-out screen. So the four screen is a little bit funny for stills for me. It's a little awkward, but it works great for videos. And that's why they made it like that because they, the X-T4 is technically not the highest end model. It's not technically not the top model for Fuji. They share that duties. The, they, that's interesting the way they do it. So the X-Pro2 or the X-Pro3, the X-T3 and the X-T4 are all flagship models. They yeah, exactly. all do slightly different things. They're, they're targeted toward slightly different users, but they all do the same thing. And obviously the X-T4 has the stabilization uh, where the other, the other two models don't. But, in, but for all the, most of the settings, it, it's just a matter of which model suits you better and do you enjoy using ergonomically better for what you're using it for. Yeah. Now, that was another thing that I found interesting with Fuji is, like you said, they basically have two flagship lines. They have the X-Pro line and the X-T line are both flagship level cameras. And, yeah. and I guess in some ways, Canon sort of had the same thing because they had the 1DX, which was their mega flagship body for sports and stuff. But technically, their 5D line was also a very high-end camera as well. Um, 
But it is interesting because the X Pro is a fantastic system. I've read a lot about that, watched a lot of videos, seen a lot of reviews about the X Pro. And uh, I'm really surprised, and, and it's probably due to COVID and the semiconductor shortage and all that, because I was kind of surprised that Fuji hadn't released an X Pro 4 yet. Um, I'm thinking, thinking that's probably this year, would be my guess. I don't know. The X Pro series gets updated a lot slower. Between the one and the two, it took five years. Oh, okay. Wow. And the, and three, between, the three has been out for how long now? Like two years or something like that? Uh, the three the three was at Photo Plus 2019. Oh, okay. the last time. So it might Photo be a Plus. couple more years yet before they release the so, X Pro. So, yeah, I, I don't think it's going to be a couple of years. Because the X Pro uh, shooters are, the, they are among the most fanatical, fanatically passionate and devoted people, users of their, of their cameras. And so, like, when I was in the, I made my recent video, and I was joking about how, you know, the X-Pro1, like I said, ran, had a five-year run. And during that time, you know, other cameras had come out, like the X-T1, even the X-T2, or an X-T2, not yet, but X-T1, X-E1, all these cameras had come out. And and you would ask X-Pro users, well, are you going to get this X-T1? And like, nope. Well, I'm waiting for the X Pro two, X Pro two. When's that coming out? Uh, I don't know. No one knows, but I'm still waiting. I'll wait <laughs> forever, as long as it takes. They're loyal. That's all. Yeah, and I and I I joke about this, but I feel the same way about the XT series. My XT one was like, like I said, I was the, I was I like to think it was made especially for me, since I was one of the first people involved in in getting to try this thing when it came out and and sharing my input about what I wanted to see on a camera like that. Yeah, exactly. so I was fanatically devoted to the X-T1 until the moment I pulled the X-T2 out of the box and turned it on. Uh, <laughs> and that was it. But I, so, I actually pulled my X-T1 out recently to play with it as well. Oh, cool. So if I understand surprised correctly. how small it was. Uh, so if I understand correctly, you still own all of your X bodies, correct? Yeah, the only one I don't have, uh, when I sold, when I got rid of my Nikon gear, I went down to my music, my, my music store. I went down to my local photo store here in Anchorage. And I traded in all my Nikon DSLR gear, all the all the AF lenses and all the bodies, uh, kept the flashes, and I traded them for uh, the 50-140, the 23 1.4 lens, and a graphite silver XT1. And I've only used the X, the graphite one a few times, and it just sat on my shelf. And I live in such a small house that I don't have much room and i decided to sell it this year and part of me regrets it but it, it wasn't being used so hopefully someone's using it but yeah, all hopefully. the other ones i still have yeah that and that was the thing that i f- always found interesting with sharky james as well because he has a uh, xt1 xt2 xt3 and the xt4 and he hasn't gotten yeah. rid of any of the old ones he just keeps them all and like you he'll like every once in a while he'll be like oh well today's a good weekend to pull out the xt1 and play with it again or this is a good month to pull out the XT2 and play with it again. So uh, there's a yeah. lot of passion and a lot of enjoyment that Fuji photographers get from their gear. And that is the big thing that Fujifilm as a company is, like we said before, catering to. They want it to be a passionate relationship that, you know, a lot of joy and a lot of good memories with their gear. So, yes, they do need to keep up technologically. They do have to release new versions, you know, new cameras every so often to stay in business. But yeah. they're concentrating more on the long term journey with each photographer, you know, being in love with using their gear. And that's the huge thing that I see in the Fuji community that some of the other uh, the other system fan, what I call fanboys and fangirls don't seem to understand. Yeah, you're right. It, it, they really do inspire a, a level of passion, not just for photography, but for the camera themselves. And, and you, you don't really see that with most of the other brands. Yeah. Um, and I think that, I mean, I certainly loved my Nikons, but it was, they were more tools than passionate devices. Yeah, exactly. Like they, yeah, they were, yeah, it, they just don't, usually the other, brand, the other brands, they don't see them guarding that kind of passion but fujifilm as i said in the begin very beginning of the x series they asked people what they wanted you know what do you want these dedicated photographers what do you want out of a camera what's going to make you happy not just here's the latest thing we're going to package it in this big box and you're going to love it 
Yeah, exactly. And uh, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but I saw an interesting video. It's been a little while now. Um, I used to follow the Digital Rev TV YouTube channel back when Kai Wynn was doing there oh, when he was the host of the show. That. And he, that, yeah. he since left them and he's doing his own YouTube channel. He's back in the UK, which is where he's originally from. Um, yeah. But I remember he did one of his videos, uh, one of two or three times he had David Hobby on there. And they were talking about travel photography. And David had just bought one of the X100 models. I think it was uh, the, might have been the X100 F yeah. T. I can't remember. I know the funny thing is the the letter at the end of the X100 line stands for the generation. So like the X100 yeah. V is the fifth fifth edition of that body uh, of that yeah. camera. And uh, David Hobby well, was talking the funny about. Thing, it's, but it's not X100. Yeah, yeah, because the F was four for four, and they'd already used F, so they had to use V. Yeah, exactly, exactly, which made <laughs> sense. Um, yeah. But I, I think in that video, it might have been the X100T was the newest one at the time. And David yeah. Hobby was talking about how he bought that for travel and street photography, and he absolutely loved it. And at that time, he um, right after he was doing the episode with Kai, he was going on, I think, a five or six country trip. For somebody, yeah. I don't know who it was, some client that he was shooting a crap ton of travel photography, photography for, and the only thing he was using was that X100 camera. Yeah, I remember uh, I was following David Hobby quite a bit uh, a few years ago, and I remember there was a time, because he was an icon shooter when he was doing his you know his career as a yeah, exactly. photographer, and then even after when he started doing the Strobus stuff. Um but I remember that there was a very specific time where he transitioned away from his Nikon gear and he, he had said, I can't remember exactly the details, but he, he did a blog post on his site and he, and he said, you know, okay, here, here's the, the industry's changing. Cameras are changing Nikon. Here's Nikon models. They don't suit me anymore. I'm going to go to this camera. And I can't remember which one it was because he was, you know, Nikon was pushing hard on the D800, and that wasn't the one he wanted. That what it didn't. That's not the one that suited him. Uh, and I can't remember exactly which one he went to, but it was very shortly after that that he discovered the X100, and that quickly uh, worked its way into his style, uh, into his yeah, in his arsenal. Yeah, yeah, he absolutely loved the X100 because he, uh, he was just talking about that in that video and how he was getting such fantastic results. And again, he was talking about the film simulations. And he's like, this is the perfect camera for travel and street photography because it's so small, I could stick it in a large coat pocket. Yeah. And just whip it out and bam, I'm ready to shoot. And, you know, I'm shooting for clients that are paying me for these photographs. And I'm doing it all with basically a super high-end point and shoot. Yeah. Which is just yeah, and, incredible. And, and the, well, the thing he really liked about it is it had leaf shutter. Yeah, exactly. Use any shutter speed. Yep, exactly. He absolutely loved that. That was something he was really crazy yeah. about was the leaf shutter. Now, uh, this qu a question I want to ask you, and I know I probably need to wrap up here because we, we've been on the air for about an hour now. And I, I, <laughs> I, they, they, it's not a show concern. My audience actually loves the longer episodes. I had a couple of uh, interviews that actually went two and a half hours, and they were some of my most popular. But I try to be considerate to the guests because I know you probably got a million other things to do. And you're four hours behind me, so it's a lot earlier in the day where you are still. Um, but one of the things I wanted to ask you before we did wrap up, and, uh, I, and I was curious to see what you would tell me on this, since you do have, or at least as far as I know, because you talk about it in your videos, you have the ear of some of the higher ups at Fuji. One question I've been dying to get answered by Fuji and contacting customer service or whatever through Fuji USA or whatever doesn't do me any good because they just give you a canned response. The one thing that's always bugged me about Fuji, and it's a minor thing to most people, but to me it drives me crazy, is one why have they never spent 20 cents to put a GPS chip in any camera they've ever made? And two, if you're not going to do that, well, actually, it's a three-part thing. If you're not going to put in a GPS chip, 
Two, why don't you create a GPS unit that'll pop in your hot shoe like Canon and Nikon and everybody else does? And three, if you're not going to do the first two, why can't you at least give us a firmware update that'll allow us to use an external GPS unit? And the only thing Fuji USA or Fuji North America, whatever, will always tell me when I hit them up about that is, yeah. oh, well, just use the camera remote app. That's not convenient. When I'm out shooting my abandoned buildings all across the state of Pennsylvania or all across the state of Georgia, I don't want to be screwing around with my phone every five seconds to geotag a photograph. Yeah, and uh, the, the, and the phone does work, but it is an extra step, and it only records. You you have you would have to change it in each location. So. Yeah, exactly. So, you have to so, you yeah, have to it, tell it the GPS records. to resync every time. Yeah, it only syncs to the location you are. So if you sync it and then walk around those all the stuff you if you walk away from that location it's not going to update yeah, that's exactly. a really good question um i've gotten around that um when not during bike tours by just having a gps with me and then using uh photo mechanic to um you know, you sync the clock on the gps with the clock on the camera and that you can sync the, the, the GPS track yeah. with your Im imagery. Yeah, that's the answer I get from all the Fuji shooters and all the forums yeah. and stuff I'm on. But I'm like, okay, Fuji, come on. Why in God's name can't you give us one of those three options? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll ask. I'll see what they say. Yeah, I just yeah. always wondered about that. And you're the only, you're the first person I've met that I've had a chance to have on the show that actually has the ear of some of the really high-level Fuji people. And I thought, well, maybe Dan can get an answer for me if he's never asked it or, you know, in the past, maybe he can ask him and, and get me a real answer because there's got to be a real answer. And, yeah. you know, and like I said, I, I'm both 30 years photography and 30 years in the IT industry. And I know darn well a GPS chip in bed inside the camera doesn't cost that much. It's a few cents, maybe 20, yeah. 25 cents for a GPS chip. And if you're not going to do that, why not sell a hot shoe mountable unit that you can charge two, three hundred dollars for like everybody else does? You know? Yeah, I'll, let, I'll ask him. And, and if not, you know, the least expensive option is just have your guys that write the software do a firmware update in the communication stack to allow me to plug in an external GPS unit and do it that way. Yeah. So I just found that the David Hobby uh, post I was talking about. Oh, um, okay. And this was. I don't see a date on it because he kind of changed the format of his blog a while back. Yeah. But I, anyway, so he was an icon shooter for his whole career, F, F2, F3, F4, F5, and then digital D1, D2, D3. But it was when the D4 came out, he decided to bail. He just, for whatever reason, uh, it, it wasn't wasn't for him. He didn't need that kind of speed. Um, and so his move at that time, instead of going to DSLR and continuing with Nikon, was to go to the phase one. Oh, okay. Phase so he went system. to a phase one medium format system. Yeah. And the funny thing is, and then he quickly, you know, the X, the X100 came out and, and he moved to that a couple of years later. And then the GFX is out. So, you know, it, it, I wonder, I don't think he's using the GFX. Um, he, he's probably still using the phase one. Well, he uses X100 for, most, for a lot of stuff, right? Yeah, I know. He was just raving about the X100 that he had in that video that he did with Kai. I mean, he couldn't say enough yeah. great things about that camera. I was like, man, you could tell just by the way he talks about it and the look in his eyes. He's absolutely in love with that piece of hardware. Oh, yeah, oh, here man. we go. So here, here's a tweet by David Hobby from uh, 2018. Um, the idea of Fuji embracing their history of small 645 film cameras it was exciting, so now he's got the GFX 50R prototype in his hands. So he, oh, he okay, may very cool. well be a, yeah. Now, see, and that's something I'm torn about myself. Um, as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, the first uh, recent Fuji camera that I got was the GFX 50R, and I did that when I transitioned out of my Canon EF gear, all my DSLR gear. Um, I'd already bought my first EOS R and a couple of RF lenses, so I decided that when I parted with my Canon DSLR gear, I decided to get a medium format for my abandoned buildings projects. And I got the GFX 50R. I looked at both the Fuji and the Hasselblad. And although they both make fantastic cameras, they're both great companies. Every review uh, from somebody that I considered reputable that wasn't just a clickbaiter and stuff like that, every one of them that compared the two systems, they were like, you know, it's just the Fuji's just better. It's just better. They've got more lenses. Their software is better. Their menu structure is better. Hasselblad has these pluses, but the majority of the pros were in the Fujifilm side. 
So I went with the GFX 50R and I absolutely love the physical design of the camera. The only thing, uh, aside from not being able to do GPS other than using their stupid phone app, which, which I hate, the only other yeah. thing I wish to God the 50R had that it doesn't have is phase detect autofocus. It's got the contrast, which is okay for still objects and stuff like that, but I'd rather have phase detect. And so, so the 50R doesn't have phase detect? No. That's the, fun, that's the other funny thing with Fuji that I've always wanted to ask them about. Yeah. So maybe you can throw this one at them as well. Why? Why is it only the GFX 100 and the 100S get phase detect autofocus? The 50S, the 50R, and the 50S Mark II all have contrast autofocus. And I don't uh, understand I, that. Yeah, I'm not really up on the GFX stuff, but my but knowing, uh, my guess is that it's a cost thing. The, 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 50, the people who are buying the 50S Rs are probably landscape and portrait shooters. Yeah, lot, that, that was the one thing shooters. I was thinking of, yeah. So they so they don't need to add the cost for a super fast autofocus system. Yeah, I that's imagine what I was thinking too. Detect has gotten, I, I'm sure the contrast detect has gotten way better than it was 10 years ago. Yeah, it was yeah, it is quite slow. a bit better. <laughs> yeah. um, see so, that, but that's where I'm torn because I want so bad to get the 100s, which is six thousand dollars for the body. But the thing I don't, I love that it's 102 megapixels. I love that it has phase detect autofocus. I don't like the fact that they made it look like a DSLR. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, the the thing about the the fate the autofocus on mirrorless cameras is that the autofocus sensors are actually on, the, the autofocus pixels are actually on the sensor. Yeah, absolutely. So it's part of the manufacturing process. So it's not like you, you can't get a, a medium, you know, Fuji can't get that sensor from wherever they purchase the actual sensors. Um, and they can't say, okay, well, let's do phase detect on this model and contrast effect on this model. They have to spec the sensor with the specific autofocus they're going to use. So yeah, yeah. you would have to spec it with, phase detect and contrast detect if you were going to do yeah. both. And so it's probably a cost issue knowing that most people are shooting landscapes and not action. With their yeah, hours. exactly. Well, and that's the yeah. big thing. And and that's one of the things I laugh at people that one of the stupid things people say, they're like, well, you know, the GFX system, you can't shoot 20 frames per second. I'm like, <laughs> what, what are you smoking? Who's shooting 20 frames per second with medium format? Why would yeah. you want to? That's not what I these know. bodies are made for. I know. It, you, you can't please all of the people all the time, but you can certainly please most of the reasonable people to, an, yeah. to a great extent. I mean, I don't, I don't care if my GFX 50R can only do one and a half or two frames per second. I didn't buy it for speed. I bought it for the dynamic range and the unbelievable resolution and the fact that it's one sexy yeah. rangefinder style body. Yeah, what is the max frame rate on that? Um, I think on the 50R, I think it's only like three frames per second or something like that. It's really low. Yeah. Yeah. I and, mean, it's and a I don't lot care. of information for the processor to, to deal with every exposure. Yeah, exactly. I mean, shooting raw. I mean, it's a, it's a, I believe it's technically a 51.2 megapixel sensor or something like that. Everybody just says 50. Um, but every, you know, like I frequently shoot raw. I know I don't have to because I have the wonderful Fujifilm film simulations, but I frequently shoot raw and, you know, oh, you don't have 10 frames per second. I'm like, dude, it's writing like 120 <laughs> megabytes every time I click the shutter. <laughs> yeah, that's a big raw file. And I'm thinking on the GFX 100 and 100 S with 102 megapixel sensor. I'm like, oh, my God, those raw files have to be massive on that thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty funny. So I'm yeah. I'm just really torn. I want I want the phase detect from the 100 s and I'd like to have the higher megapixel resolution and dynamic range of that 102 megapixel sensor, but I don't want to give up the sexiness of the 50R body, to be honest. Yeah, and I like I said, I think it really is cost because they they did make the GA the 50R a much a pretty reasonable price. Oh yeah. I mean when it first and, came and out, so, it was forty five hundred dollars. For a medium yeah, format, I mean that's crazy. And what is it now? Now they've got a, they've been running an ad or a sale for like three months now, where you can get it for like three grand, brand new. Oh yeah, twenty nine ninety nine or something. Yep. Yeah, yeah it's, the, that, that's an incredible offer, and exactly. people are yeah, it's a great way to get those cameras in people's hands. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. And the, the original one hundred was ten thousand dollars. That's why I you know I oh, true, I was yeah. like whoa I'm not spending that much on a medium yeah. format body. And then they came out with the one hundred S, which they 
basically shrunk the 100 down, made it more of a DSLR style body with the same sensor. And mm-hmm. they, they came out with the 100S at a $6,000 price point, which is just insane. And, yeah. and right now, not only with their technology, their color science, with their film profiles and all of that stuff, Fuji is honestly just crushing it in both APS-C and now crop medium format. Because yeah, I see really way are. I see way more people shooting GFX than I ever see shooting Hasselblad's X1D. Yeah, they really are. They they have, I mean, you know, when the X series was was really coming into its prime with the XT one and two and and uh, you, you know you would always get the people, well, oh, they need full frame. It's not full frame. You know, it's not it's not good enough. So it's not full frame. So Fuji's answer is not to make the X series full frame. It's to just come out with a camera that's still smaller and lighter than a full size DSLR with a just enormous sensor. Yeah. Like, okay, you want a bigger sensor here? Yep. There you go. Shut up. <laughs> and it's funny because in one of his recent videos, uh, Tony, uh, Tony Northrup said that was one of Fuji's biggest mistakes was wasting their time and being distracted coming out with their medium format system. No. And I watched that video and I'm like, what is he smoking? Fuji no, is right it's now been really well received. Yeah, Fuji right now is the king of both APS-C and crop medium format. They didn't do anything wrong. They dominate in both markets. Yeah, they they have made some brilliant moves, and and the GFX has been incredibly well received. By oh yeah, people. I see more and more yeah. people buying the GFX bodies all the time. It's crazy. A lot of people are scooping up the 50R now that it's three thousand dollars brand new. I mean, that's yeah, a, that's a, that's a crazy, crazy low price. price. And I don't yeah, think I mean, Castleblad's compare... ever going to come out with one that cheap. Oh, yeah. I actually I was co-leading a photo workshop uh, a few years ago, and there was one of the guys who had one of the digital Hasselblads. And it was like $12,000 camera. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. But, yeah, I, I'm just... I, I'm, I, have, I got to babysit a GFX for a couple days one time. I was doing an event for Fujifilm in Austin, Texas. And for their current rep was not able, the current rep for that area was not able to make it down for that, for that particular event. So they sent a GFX to the store and then, and then I got to, and then I, you know, basically it, after the event, it went into my care so that I could send it back to Fujifilm um, after the event, but I got to take this out and, and play around with it for the night. And then part of the next day, it was pretty cool. Absolutely. I, there were three lenses with it. Yep. I had fun. Um, but it, for me, it's not, the, it's not my style of camera, but I can understand why people are so freaking out about this thing. It, oh yeah. It's amazing quality. Well, yeah. I mean, you got to look at it. Honestly, you got the only two companies that are making cropped medium format are Fujifilm with the GFX and Hasselblad with their X1D line. And yeah. Hasselblad come out with the X1D 50C. And a couple of years later, they came out with the X1D 50C Mark II. Well, guess what? Both bodies were $10,000. Fuji went the right way. They're like, okay, well, let's come out with the 50S first and we'll sell that for $6,000. Then a year yeah, later, yeah. then a year later, or nine months later, or whatever, let's unveil the 100X that's got double the megapixels, yeah. and it's ten thousand dollars, <laughs> but it's more of our flagship medium format body. And then what they do a year or so later, they're like, oh, well, let's roll out the 50R, which is only forty five hundred dollars. Yeah, so it's like Fuji's the brilliant of the GFX line. Yeah, Fuji's been brilliant with this line. They got a ten thousand dollar body, a six thousand dollar body. One that was well, they had one that was forty five, which was a fifty R. That's now dropped to three grand, but the fifty S two took its slot because that one's forty five, four thousand if you buy it without the kit lens. If you get it with the the new thirty five to seventy f four lens, it's the forty five hundred. So yeah, so that's what I'm thinking. I'm like. Uh, I'm starting to think the same as some of the other guys like me that had the 50 R it's like, mm, really love the higher megapixel sensor. Don't like the DSLR styling of the 100 S. So maybe I'm just going to sit back and wait and see how many more years it's going to be before Fuji goes, bam, 50 R Mark two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause I have a feeling it's coming. They already did it with the S so it's gotta be coming for the R. Yeah. I mean, the technology keeps marching ahead. So this is an interesting time for Fujifilm because they're as as sensor technology increases, 
uh, you know, that's benefiting both lines. And, and so now they're kind of entering, they're about to enter phase two or just for the next phase of their, of their, you know, legacy or, or, you know, however, what are you going to call it? Um, and this is where they're now starting to introduce second generation lenses, uh, for their, for their initial X series lenses. Yeah. Okay. Yep. I, and I haven't been following this too closely, but I did see that they're coming out with the second generation of their 2314. And a couple others as well. I don't remember which ones, but yeah, I think they I have. Think, I think they have a Mark II of the twenty-seven two point eight pancake coming out. And Patrick at Fuji Rumors told me that one of the lenses I wanted to get because I asked his recommendation was the fifty-six millimeter one point four because that's close to eighty-five millimeter in full frame for portraits. And he's like, "But wait, because later on this year they're releasing the Mark II of that lens, so you might right. as well wait yeah. and get that one." Yeah. And, so they had the initial fifty-six one two. And then they had the one two with the uh, I can't remember the the designation, but it had the the special out of focus thing inside it. Oh, the OIS. No. Oh no the, no no the different autofocus. Okay, yeah yeah yeah. I no, it wasn't up. the different autofocus. It was the like the focus. Uh, it, it wasn't around that long. Um, it was a different focus like, motor, maybe. No, it was. Um, Oh yeah, it was the fifty. Um, no, it was the Fuji. Oh, I can't. I can't remember what it was called. It, it had like the defocus uh, aspect to it. Oh, the um, defocus smoothing. You mean? Yeah, something like that. But that Canon's done with some of their oh, RF oh, glass. The, the APD. Oh, the okay. Fuji film one point two APD. Oh, and okay. The APD was was the. Uh, I can't even remember what the. Some sort of the de- APD focus mechanism. Yeah, or yeah some sort of some sort of defocusing control to make for for more creative portraits. And oh, it, okay. it, that wasn't in the line very long, and they, it didn't. I don't think it did very well. Oh, okay. Um, but now they're, but the fifty six is unbelievably sharp lens, and it had it had really slow autofocus. But with the with the newer bodies like the XT three and four, the faster processor does help that and make them snappier. But oh, cool. they're obviously coming out with the weather, the Mark II version. Yep. So I don't know what that's going to hold. Yeah, because I see another, even though it's one of their less expensive lenses, because I didn't know this for a long time, that Fuji actually has two different X lines of lenses. They have the XC and the XF. The C yeah. being their less expensive stuff, consumer grade, I guess. And the XF is their higher end glass. Um, but I've talked to a lot of people in some of the Fuji groups I'm in and forums and they're like, uh, they're telling other, you know, students and stuff. They're like, oh, man, you know, you got a, an XE3 or whatever, and you want a good, you know, telephoto lens for wildlife for school assignments or something like that. Get the XC50 to 230, I think it is. They just, yeah. they just marked to that. And it's got OIS and weather sealing. And it's like less than 300 bucks oh, brand yeah. new. It's crazy. Yeah, I remember the first time I tried that lens, I got to use that once. And I was, I was amazed. And you're right. It's. I actually have a couple XC lenses. I don't use them very often, but uh, the other day when I was shooting my X my X series video retrospective, the, the episode, one of the episodes, and I I wanted to feature. I shoot all my vi- episodes with my thirty five one four or my thirty five f two, which is one of my favorite lenses. But I wanted to show that in the video, so I pulled out my XC. Uh, which one was it? It was like the fifteen to or 15, sixteen to fifteen 80. to forty five or something. No, it was the sixteen. It was the XC sixteen to eighty. Oh, okay. And so I just threw that on my XT four and shot the video with it. <laughs> it worked great. Yeah. And but yeah, I remember somebody asked me about the fifteen to forty five. It was when I did my review video for the sixteen to eight, and he asked me. He's one of these fifteen to forty five users and asked me if he should get the, the sixteen instead. And I didn't know anything about the 15 to 45, but I started doing some research and I was amazed by the number of people who just are blown away by that lens. Apparently the 15 to 45 XC lens, which I don't think it's made anymore, but it was the kit lens for a while on some of the bodies. And apparently it's a a crazy uh, high quality optic, especially out at the widest angle, the 15 millimeter. Yeah. I, and that's the thing. I, I wasn't super shocked because I've seen a lot of those uh, posts in the in the Fuji groups I'm in that the XC, fi- I think it was the 50 to 230 Mark II, 
and the 15 to 45, you know, get recommended all the time because, and, and everybody's like, oh my God, they're so inexpensive to buy and they are just ridiculously sharp and great for such an inexpensive lens. And Canon had a few on their side. Uh, most camera companies, you know, if they give you the kit with the 18 to 55, it's a junk lens. And yeah. even though it's not super wide aperture, Canon's 18 to 55 STM, uh, which they're up to the Mark II now that they use as the kit lens with their well, a lot of their DSLR bodies. Uh, it's a 3.5 to 5.6, I think it is, or maybe it's 3.5 to 4.5. 18 to 55 is stupid sharp. I mean, that lens yeah, is ridiculously it's, sharp considering it's like a $200 lens. Yeah, it's like Fuji's 18 to 55, which is actually an expensive lens. Yeah, exactly. Like when, when, when that came out, people were freaking out how good that was. Yep. So I just looked. I, I had the 15 to six, the 16 to 50. Oh, yeah, that's another popular one, and too. That, that's the one I was just talking about. It's not 16 to 80, it's 16 to 50. Oh, uh, okay. And I don't use it very, I hardly use it. It, it came, I, it came on one of the XT10s that I was using at the time. Uh, I had ordered a second one, and it came on that. And I just, I was like, oh, I don't really need this lens. I just kind of put it away. And I've never really used it shooting, but I pulled it out the other day to shoot the video. And so I was like, oh, this worked great. So now I'm going to skip start shooting all my videos with it because it's it's there and it's easy and if i need to adjust the zoom let's have that yeah absolutely yep yeah. nothing wrong with that well dan like i said i don't want to keep you too long we've been about an hour and a half now which you know like i said is fine as far as the show's concerned but i don't know how busy you are i'm sure you probably got a bunch of things going on um, so it's funny that you talk about the length of um so i try to keep my youtube videos around 10 minutes yep uh i figure that was a nice concise uh time frame uh, every once in a while I start to get longer and I, and I, with, with, with this X series series, that retrospective that I'm doing, they've been getting longer because I have so much to tell. Exactly. And I'm like, Oh God, they're getting longer. This next one's 17 minutes. Like first one was 10 then 13 then 17. And the last one was 20 minutes. I was like, Oh, that's, is that too long? And it was like, boom, my fastest growing video for viewership ever on my YouTube channel. Oh, yeah. Like immediately. It's, it's funny because some YouTube videos, I've seen some channels, they do keep their stuff at 10 minutes because they claim if they shoot their, you know, if they upload longer videos, the yeah. the, the viewership and everything just goes, you know, it flattens right out, just dies. But yeah. there are some channels out there that can do extremely long episodes or videos and they'll still get tons of views. And yeah. you don't have to worry about that because you have so much information in your series. You're, five, you're up to five parts now, probably getting ready to post the sixth one soon. Um, well, I actually was, was going to go on vacation last week, as I had told you on the, te on the chat. On the text. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and we were supposed to leave Sunday night, and I was going to be gone for a week. So my, I was going to postpone my video. The episode six was going to be coming next week, uh, like a week late. Oh, okay. But we actually didn't go. The The flight was canceled. And so we ended up coming home. We postponed our trip for later this month. And so I haven't even worked on it yet. So the, the third, the, the episode six will come at some point. Maybe I'll shoot it next week and get it up. Oh, no problem. So, yeah, yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't see you having any problem with drop off, you know, as your videos get a little bit longer because you just have so much great information in them and you're so passionate about what you're talking about. That's the other big thing with YouTube videos. You can get away with having longer videos if you have yeah. a lot of good information in the videos and you have a lot of good energy in your videos, which you do so much passion in your videos. Yeah, I'm really pleased. I, I, I've had the YouTube channel for quite a number of years, but I really only started doing these Fuji ones and, and these photography tutorials, I think in the summer of 2019, I think uh, August 1st of 19 was the first that was my first video and ironically that's my most watched video it's it's over eighty thousand views now i think oh that's cool um, and so but yeah so i i i i'll get in these spurts where i'll do one a week for a month or two a couple months at a time and then i'll kind of drop off for a little bit um but yeah i it's been really fun to grow the channel and get tons of support from viewers i'm about to hit i just check my my numbers. I'm about to hit 10,000 subscribers. Oh, sweet! I, think I need at, at the time of we're speaking this right now. I'm at nine nine eight two. So, oh, sweet! And and I'm so I'm just really pleased that I've gotten so much support uh, from all the people who are tuning in and subscribing and watching the videos and making comments. Because I, I do feel that I have a lot of good information to share, and I feel I've got the pictures to back up 
you know, what I say. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and so I just, it, I, I'm just really pleased that it, that my, what I have to say has resonated with so many people. Yeah. I think your channel is going to blow up yeah. pretty good. I think over the next I, couple of years, you're going to see it balloon quite a lot. I, I see these, uh, I see these other channels. These guys have like a million followers. I'm like, how, how do you get that? Well, yeah, but um, believe it or not, except for the really lucky ones or really talented yeah. ones. Like if you take, uh, as an example, Tony and Chelsea Northrup or yeah. Jared Poland from Nose Photo from Philadelphia, which I'm originally from yeah. Pennsylvania. Um, I know of his channel. Yeah, they're both at a million and a half creeping up on two million subscribers, but it took them 11 years to get there. And then you yeah, have- I know that. And you have somebody else come along that has great energy and is super talented and he's great at videography. And that is um, Peter McKinnon up in Canada. He shot up to like 10 million subscribers in like three years just because his videos are so insanely good as far as quality. There's a couple of music, um, music guys, like guitar guys who I follow. And, you know, they're in the millions and I mean, they're good. I, I can see why they why they get that. Oh, yeah. It's just crazy to think that, you know, to get those kinds of numbers. Well, um, and and I'm, I'm in I'm in no hurry. I, I grew my blog following is the same way. My blog and newsletter organically growing slow but steady yeah. over the years. Yep. Nothing so, wrong and with I've, that. like I said, I've only been doing the YouTube channel um, with these kinds of videos for a year and a half or two and a half years, I guess. Yep. 19, 20, yeah. And if you and if you didn't know it, when you hit your one hundred thousand subscribers, uh, Google will send you a silver Google Play button plaque to hang up on your wall. No way! Yeah. that's cool. Yeah, before Google bought it out, it used to when YouTube was its own company before they got gobbled up by Google. Used to yeah. be when you hit ten thousand subscribers, you got a bronze play button, and then wow. when Google took over, they did away with that. You don't get your first award until you hit a hundred thousand and then you get your next one at like a million and then you get your next one at like 10 million damn it i almost have my bronze i'm at almost at ten thousand. i know i know isn't that heartbreaking yes. you got screwed out of the bronze play button uh, <laughs> that's all right well yeah, dan done. it's been absolutely wonderful having you on here and and i absolutely love your passion for photography and your fuji gear uh, Thanks, it's, Liam. It's fantastic. I mean, it, like I said, it comes through talking to you today. It comes through in your videos. It's just yeah. awesome. And uh, make sure you text me any and all social media that you want me to include in the show notes. I'll put in your YouTube channel and your website. Um, I think I have you on Instagram too. I'll double check. Um, yeah, I've been really. I, I've I've been more active on Instagram in the past few past couple months than I had been for a while. And like I said, one of my favorite things to do lately is, is make these short videos, like 30 seconds and 45 seconds or one minute videos. And then I'll score them with original music. And it's a really fun, creative thing for me because I love producing music, but, and and a lot of what I talk, a lot of the way I teach and a lot of the things that I talk about when I, when I'm doing instruction relate to my own experiences with music. So, for example, I might want to sit down and write some music, and I'll have all these mental blocks like, well, what, what should it be? What key should it be? And well, how should I write? What should it sound like? What, what key should I use? What plugin should I use to make these sounds? What, what instrument should I play on? And I just get these blocks. And so I found with these videos that I'm making, I'll just go into Final Cut Pro, throw in a handful of clips, I'll export a 30 second video or one minute video, and then I'll throw it into Logic Pro, and I'll just play it, and I'll just and I'll just pull up a sound and start playing whatever comes to mind, you know, for very short duration. And then I'll layer a couple other, a couple other parts on there and it's done. I have a finished piece of music that came out of my own creativity organically, just by, by playing along to whatever ideas that stem from me watching this video that I made. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. And, and, and so those go into my Instagram reels and, oh, that's, cool. and that's what I've been doing lately. And then, and, and then I also started, uh, a, a second Instagram channel for my music, which is Dan Bale and music. And, and that just, it's more, more music geekery of me playing, actually playing guitar and, and like guitar photos that I've shot with my Fuji cameras. And like the last week I was shooting photos with my, the 70 to 300. Uh, and then, so put just, put just posting music, music videos of me playing and my music. I actually released my own album of, of rock songs uh, and guitar instrumentals during the pandemic that came out almost a year ago, April of 2021. Oh, cool. 
Well, if you so, want, I can share out both your Instagrams in the show notes. Yeah, so, so I'll send totally you all the cool. information. But yeah, so everybody um, who's listening, I'm, I'm glad you tuned in. Uh, thanks, Liam, for having me. Yeah, absolutely. I always love geeking out on this stuff. <laughs> Someday I've got to get up to Alaska. It's one of only two states yeah. I've never been to. I haven't been to Hawaii yet. I haven't been to Alaska yet. I've been to all and, the other 48 states, just haven't oh. gotten to those two yet. Yep. Yeah, you definitely got to come now. Things are opening up. Oh, yeah. And one more thing that I want to say. Um, I know that some of your users probably use Luminar, yep. uh, photo processing program. I've been a Luminar user um, for quite a while. In fact, I was um, used. I was in San Diego. Um, I happened to be down there when, like, the week it was launched, and so I got to go to the office and meet the guys, and then you know get the, one of the, start using the software as soon as it was released. Well, a lot of people may not know this, but the the company that make the company that makes Luminar uh, it's called Skylum and they're actually based in, in Kiev, Ukraine. Oh, really? And their engineers are from Kiev. Uh, there's the two that I know, there's three of them that I know. Uh, there's Ivan, uh, Dimitri, and there's one other guy that I can't remember his name. And then there's some of the affiliate, uh, people, just some of the other, uh, people who run the, the marketing side, but they're in Kiev and oh, yeah, they, that's actually, right. they are. Yep. So they put out an email last week and, and then social media post that says, Hey, we're under attack. Um, you know, please be thinking of us, watch, you know, you keep in, keep in touch with the news here, donate, you can donate to these organizations, you can donate to the Ukraine army. Um, and then they said, uh, and we're sorry, we might not be able to get our next update, uh, Luminar Neo out in time. Like uh, we yeah. said, we would. It's like, don't worry about that. Just, I mean, they're like hiding in the subway tunnels and it's really tragic. So yeah, I just want is. everybody to, anybody who's a Luminar user, you know, send good thoughts and, I mean, whatever, you know, just be, be thinking about our brothers and sisters in, in, in Ukraine. Yeah, I, absolutely. I find myself, I have the hardest time not saying the Ukraine because I grew up playing Risk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was always the Ukraine. But I know yep. I've read that, that Ukrainians that don't, don't like that term because that term was used uh, like when it was part of the Russian bloc and the Soviet yeah. bloc. Yep. It was just the, U, the Ukraine province. So, yeah, pray for, our, you know, think about our Ukrainian brothers and sisters who are fighting for lives over there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that's tragic. I mean, it's sad. It really is. It's so sad. It's it's terrifying because we have now entered, we in, for all purposes, we have we have now entered the, the beginning stages of essentially World War III. Yep, exactly. Uh, which, which, and no one knows how it's going to play out now. And even if it doesn't become a massive uh, conflict of troops and weapons and nuclear weapons, hopefully not, God forbid, uh, the fact that the entire world, nearly the entire world is allied against Russia right now uh, with armed support and hacking support and monetary support. It, it Like I said, this, we have just entered World War III in the beginning stages. Yeah. And it's yep. terrifying. It's crazy. It <laughs> and is. so that's where creativity and photography is is one of those things that can help keep us sane during these really challenging times, you know, through COVID and through COVID and now this is where emerging now this now this bullshit. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But yeah, I definitely I gotta get my butt up to Alaska one of these years. I'll have to hit you yeah. up when I do finally get up there. Maybe you can take me out to some of the cool scenes and stuff like that. Yeah, definitely keep in touch. Yeah. Or maybe maybe I could even get you to take me up in the airplane so I can get some aerial photographs. <laughs> it's pretty fun. I don't know how expensive yeah. that gets, but uh that that <laughs> mine's, definitely mine's be cool. not very expensive. My plane is built in 1947 and has a two seats and an 85 horse motor so it's not very expensive to run <laughs> yeah well that's cool um, and where are you based again uh i'm actually in a small uh, outside a small town called roxborough oh. north carolina i'm right on the border between north carolina and virginia uh, but i'm originally from northeastern pennsylvania and my wife's originally from the northern tier of new york not new york state upper new york yeah. um and uh, we her and i just got back together and got remarried a couple of years ago um, but I'm from Pennsylvania. I spent 10 years down at Fort Benning, which is in Columbus, Georgia, when I was with the Army Rangers. And then uh, I ended up moving back to Adla the Atlanta area about 17 years ago. Uh, well, no, actually, technically now it'd be like 18 or 19 years ago. And we just moved up to Roxborough this past year because we 
she didn't like the city. She didn't like all yeah. the traffic around Atlanta, the crazy way people drive around there. And uh, we're both from the country originally. So now we got us a nice acre and a half piece of land with a nice house out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> And that's funny because our trip that we weren't able to take was actually to North Carolina. And we were heading to Raleigh. Oh, really? Oh, my God. Yeah. Well, Dan, so you, actually, might, you might have to hit me up when you come down here. <laughs> yeah, so we're actually extending our trip. We're, we're, we're going to go at the end of March and, uh, and stay longer. Oh, cool. Well, definitely so, let me know when you come down yeah. because I'm only, I'm only a little over an hour away from Raleigh. Okay, we'll be, we'll be in touch. Absolutely. Down there. Yeah, cool. Well, thanks again for your time, Dan. It's been fantastic having you on the show. Thank you for sharing all of your knowledge and wisdom on the Fuji film. And I definitely encourage all of my listeners to watch his videos. The links will be in the show notes so you can check them out for yourself. But yeah, thank- according to Liam, I'm the channel who's going to blow up here in any, any day now. Oh, yeah. I, well, trust me, as good as your videos are, I can see your channel constantly growing. And uh, hopefully yeah. my audience will help it grow a little bit faster for you. Yeah, I have seen my subscribership growing doubling since i started putting up these these series in the past month yeah they're uh, they're great videos i mean that was the yeah. uh, the perfect time you've been with fuji for pretty much the whole 10 year of the x series so yeah. that's the perfect time to do it now yeah it's been really fun so i'm excited to keep going because there's a lot more to tell oh yeah we i can done imagine episode five and there's a lot more to tell <laughs> so. i can imagine well thank you again sir you have yourself a wonderful rest of your day and uh, we'll talk again soon Thanks, Liam. You too. Take care, and and we'll be in touch. All right. Take care, buddy. Okay, bye. Bye. All right, so that is going to wrap up episode 229 of the Liam Photography Podcast. I want to thank all of my listeners once again for subscribing, rating, and reviewing an Apple Podcast, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Also, stop by the Liam Photography Podcast podcast show notes page Uh, you'll find the link in your podcatcher so you can find all of dan's links his website his youtube channel his instagram pages all of that stuff is in the show notes i highly encourage you to check out his retrospective on the x series his journey with the x series they are fantastic videos and if you are just getting into fujifilm x series or if you already been shooting x series and you want to get the most information you could possibly get on your x series camera and all that it can do i highly recommend when you stop by dan's site pick up a copy of his ebooks is ebook x series unlimited it is absolutely phenomenal i bought it myself a couple weeks ago i read through the whole thing all 400 pages it is just a beautiful ebook well written well done he has great sample images in there it's just fantastic so definitely reach out and and buy a copy of that ebook support dan he's a wonderful guy he's a super talented photographer hopefully maybe we can get him on the show again down the road but uh we'll have to wait and see but again i want to thank him for his time and i will see you guys all again on sunday for the latest news and rumors